started. Uh, Rao, are you ready to give the uh, technical update? Um, yes, give me one sec. Um, so it's, uh, I guess, a little over three years or close to three years that we've been doing the community updates, at least according to the number of written down community updates. Um, so uh, where we are with the releases, uh, basically uh, Gurinder has been updating the test net with the 0926 um, release candidate, which is the last finalized state released uh, candidate. And he'll soon uh, spin up some um, last finalized state nodes on the uh, main net as read-only nodes initially. Um, and the idea is that once we have it running there uh, for a period of time, we'll convert them into validator nodes later on. We're also getting ready for the uh, upcoming epoch change around the 21st of December or so. And the intention is to have uh, these, uh, we're going to have more nodes than we have right now. Right now we have 20. Uh, the plan is to have 30 nodes for the next epoch. And we'll do that by adding the new nodes as LFS nodes um, and then converting everything to LFS as, um, as we go along. So that's the plan with that. Um, in terms of the LFS code base itself, um, everything is, uh, like I said, things are already going on the test net, but there are a, a couple of things that are being worked on. One is an integration, uh, is the uh, integration test that Will and Thomas Lau are working on. And um, also uh, there was one uh, bug that, was discovered related to synchrony constraints. Uh, so Thomas Slav uh, has a fix for that in and that and the test, the integration test and the new test that Thomas Slav has put in will all be wrapped into the final, last finalized state um, release. Um, and uh, so the, the information about the synchrony constraint bug is here in the synchrony constraint calculation. Um, what, with this, we should be able to run validators on the, um, with this in place, we should be able to run validators on the last finalized state. So that's where we are with the last finalized state version and the networks and, and the plans for the releases on the different networks. A lot of the time is uh, being spent on block merge, um, really. Tomislav also is uh, working on uh, block merge now with Will in, uh, in the conflict resolution uh, branch, so to speak, or conflict resolution piece. Nazipur has been uh, working on the, uh, uh, actually enabling the uh, block merge. Um, he's been doing a, a a bunch of refactorings and then a couple of a few bugs uh, that needed to be resolved to make that happen. Um, so the most recent uh, PR that he has put out is for uh, refactoring the hot store. Basically hot store refers to in-memory tuple space. It contains some stuff read from the LMDB, some stuff that's coming in from the uh, Rolang that's being executed and all of that. So he has refactored that uh, in order to both simplify debugging for the uh, tuple space mismatch uh, errors and el eliminate the uh, error. So that's one piece uh, he is on. And the other, um, there is another, uh, there was a test failing related to timestamps and it, it turns out that for now, really what needs to be done is that the test needs to be fixed. Um, but in the long run, this relates to the issue that was put here about, um, you know, how do we create unforgeable names and how do we make sure that they don't conflict? So there may be some future improvements there that need to be worked on in, in terms of what all is taken into consideration in um, creating uh, the signatures and unforgeable names and, and, and all of that. That's this issue three um, that I think Tomislav had documented on the um, repo before. 
Um, another piece is um, I talked about <clears throat> what we suspect to be a peak bug um, last week, I believe. And then uh, really the solution here seems to be to make peak reads atomic, uh, which means basically implement a read as a get a lock, consume, produce, and release the lock. Um, so seems like this would simplify things. And, um, but the thing is, while this may simplify the semantics um, of peak, because of the way, the fact that peak is used in many different places, we'll have to do some extensive testing on this. Uh, but that's another thing that's in the uh, in the pipeline uh, to be looked at. This is probably not super critical right now if the uh, if this is not getting in our way, but it is something that may need to be done um, sooner or later. At least need, needs to be evaluated to see what impact it has. Um, the other uh, piece of work Nadzipper is doing is really trying to bring the branches together, the, the stream that uh, Will is working on, the, uh, the stream that Nadzipper is working on, merging those together, and then also merging that on top of the uh, last finalized state uh, uh, um, branch, which is the main dev uh, branch right now. So that, um, you know, once he's resolved these couple of uh, things, he'll be doing that. He'll be getting to that point where we begin to bring block merge on top of the last finalized state. And there'll probably be some issues to resolve there. So that's where we are with the whole block merge uh, activity. And we will be uh, do, releasing block merge in uh, small releases and uh, we can, uh, the, the the block merge work itself is broken into basically not considering joints or considering joints as conflicts initially, and then coming back and resolving joints. Um, so at least um, from a conceptual or, or formulaic standpoint, the math standpoint, I think it, there's clarity on that as to how that needs to be done now. And then when we implement that, we have to see what, what we might run into. That's where we are. Dependencies, there has not been much of a change. Um, rolling, uh, on Rolang 1.1, Joe has made uh, more progress. He has completed the uh, synchronous reads in addition to the let syntax that he had already completed. And uh, he's putting uh, the, uh, his PRs in, in the Rolang 1.1 branch. And um, Greg, uh, is thinking that it would be beneficial if he focuses on completing the syntax surface first and then do the implementation. So I think Joe is going to be moving in that direction. And when uh, something is ready uh, with Rolang 1.1, we'll again have a release candidate that uh, uh, the community at large can test and play with. Um, like Greg mentioned earlier, initial implementation of this uh, is going to be uh, just a syntax translation from the Rolang 1.1 to existing uh, Rolang 1.0 uh, spec. And then once we see how things are working, there will be uh, uh, opportunities for performance improvements, uh, as well as we'll, we'll have to do some extensive testing when we uh, change the contracts to go to a uh, new Rolang 1.1 syntax. So that's the, uh, that's the plan on that. Um, in the API, Tomislav has added a new PR, um, which adds conversion for Rolang set to JSON. Um, and there were already par, tuple, and list earlier, and now uh, set is um, added that converts to a JSON list. And um, there are more uh, types of keys um, in the uh, uh, in the map, so that in now includes um, uh, primitives uh, like in int, boolean, and URI. So they will be uh, they are converting to string uh, representation and uh, and then unforgeable names converted into hex string. So that's kind of a nice uh, addition to the API. 
at this point. And I think as folks are doing more development, uh, that should come in handy uh, for people like Raphael and others who are doing uh, uh, development. That's the uh, change on the API. Let me see if there's anything else major that I need to cover here. Uh, I already talked about uh, what the work that uh, Gurinder is doing on, um, uh, on the uh, getting ready for the next epoch and adding uh, new servers. And in there, what we're doing is uh, IBM has a couple of different, uh, there's the legacy and there's a VPC, I guess a couple of different kinds of VPC. So we're, we're noticing quite a bit of performance difference, especially around disk IO in the different regions and different environments that IBM has. So Gurinder is trying to resolve all of that and try to uh, figure out um, what's the optimal combination for us to be uh, running in terms of you know, which regions and, and what kind of machines to be able to keep things on a, on a um, stable uh, basis so we don't run into this uh, disk IO. The plan is to run multiple nodes on sort of a bigger machine and not just CPU and memory, but also disk IO becomes a bottleneck when we do that. So we're kind of trying to, we're experimenting with different combinations uh, and that will take a few days uh, to really learn what works uh, and what is becoming the biggest gating factor for us. And then, of course, there's also the size of the disk itself, um, just from the standpoint of how much data you can hold there if you're running multiple nodes. So there, there are at least those four parameters, CPU, memory, disk size, and disk I.O. that we have to contend with as we do this uh, uh, migration to multiple nodes on a, on a machine. So, and then once we have block merging, because of its behavior, there'll be a lot more uh, variability there, meaning basically the CPU memory at least will get used up a lot, probably also the disk IO, all of that. So we need to look at that pre-block merge and post-block merge, what it'll be. So that's kind of the work that Gurinder is focused on. So that I think all is all I have to say. Um, are there any questions on anything that I have uh, said so far? All right, over to you, Greg. Uh, awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to reiterate that the algorithm I described uh, last week um, is the algorithm that uh, we're going for with the block merge. So if you need a refresher, uh, just go back to last week's discussion and you'll, you'll see that um, it's, a, it's a very simple algorithm to do the block merge um, and it's, uh, we have an advantage um, because of Rolang, because we don't have to recompute things in order to do the merge. <clears throat> we also have some other exciting stuff. I believe that Raphael wants to give a demo. Is that correct? Um, yep. Okay. Yeah, that is correct. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Yeah. So, uh, Raphael, over to you. Okay. So, I am. Hi, everyone. I'm Raphael from the. Dapi project. I'm also a member of the co-op. So I'm going to uh, talk about what I've been working on um, in the off-chain world and in the Dapi world. So let's share my screen. <clears throat> okay, so the, the, the first thing I want to show is that um, I've uh, developed a um, smart contract uh, which is kind of like the ERC-1155 that I worked on before uh, and that is now uh, abandoned in favor of uh, this one, Archain token. So there's a bunch of rolling files and uh, JavaScript utilities to, um, to deploy a contract and um, manage asset ownership on the blockchain. And I developed it um, so I can use it in all the... Um, the DAPI ecosystem. So I'll, I'll show you uh, how I use it. Um, so DAPI is, um, 
is a web browser and a protocol. And um, one of the components is the name system, which envisions to kind of, um, which is kind of an alternative to the regular DNS system. So uh, we do uh, this name system. Uh, we use Archin token um, as the backend for the DAPI name system. So I am in the DAPI browser. If I go in the names list, you see a list of names. And, um, and we can check with the Archin token CLI. We can have a list of those names and we will see how they are, how the ownership is expressed on the blockchain. So let's go to my CLI. So I'm going to do node CLI view and give the registry URI where the names are stored. And this command should output the list of all the bags in the Archin token contract. And um, those bags, we call uh, them names in, inside the, the, the JavaScript, the, the DAP ecosystem. But um, as an Archin token resource, they are called bagged, bags. So we see that there is a zero bag um, which contains a lot of tokens and uh, each token is priced at 2000. And then when, what happens is that anyone can purchase from this bag zero and create a new bag, which will have a name. And this will be uh, the name that you own in the DAPI name system. For example, someone owns, um, let me find it. Um, someone owns the, the test three name, but I guess it will um, not match anything. Okay, file does not exist, but at least the name exists. Um, but I just, I've not attached any uh, resource to this name, but I own uh, this name in the DAPI uh, name system. So this is the, the first thing and uh, the next thing is that uh, there is a new release of DAPI 035. So all the, um, the components have been updated to work with uh, the Archin token. Um, so the name system, as I just showed, as well as um, the address system. So as uh, as you see, there is another registry URI in the uh, bar here. And this, um, this DAP, so this HTML file is also stored on the blockchain because it's a DAP. And it also uses a Archin token contract. So I'm going to get back to my CLI and instead of listing uh, the names of the name system, I'm going to check this contract to see what's inside. <clears throat> so, okay. Um, so um, as I explained, um, I think in, in previous presentations, this, uh, this, what you see on this screen is a DAP. So you can click it to see decentralized application. It means that all um, the thing that you see are stored on the Archain blockchain. And uh, this precise DAP is kind of a fun application to raise funds. So you can create a, a canvas like this one and anyone will be able to purchase specific cell and give a color. And we use the same uh, paradigm um, to express uh, cell ownerships as the one we use to uh, express names ownerships. So you can see here all the bags and each one. So if the line is green, it means that um, I uh, own uh, this bag. So you can see there's a lot of them and some of them are not for sale. And uh, those are the one that has been purchased already. So all the, all the lines uh, are green because I'm the only one to, to purchase from myself. But basically, um, if someone else purchase a cell in this um, uh, contract, uh, it, uh, the line will not be green. And you see that there is also this index 
uh, line and this bag uh, it con contains the actual HTML file. So the HTML and uh, the, the representation of the ownerships of the cells are all part of the same unified protocol, which is Archin token. Um, okay, so now um, I, I just wanted to show that uh, there was an article that was uh, published today. So you might want um, to check it because it, um, it sums up what uh, the purpose of DAPI uh, is, what one of the main purpose of DAPI is, uh, which is to simplify all things related to name uh, management uh, on the internet network. So I briefly explain uh, how uh, DNS giants can easily be compromised and how uh, the multi-request paradigm uh, deals with these uh, flows of the DNS system. And um, I also wanted to show a cool feature of DAPI, so I just uh, showed you a, a DAP on DAPI, but you can also uh, link internet servers to uh, the name system. And I'm going to um, to show you an, an example of how easy it is to to get a website uh, from the DNS system to DAPI. So I'm just going to check the New York Times website, okay? Then I'm going to copy uh, just nytimes.com and, um, and, and since DAPI is an alternative to the DNS, you have to register. Um, can this go, go uh, escape? Okay, so never mind. Um, so you have to register a name um, outside the DNS system, uh, which means uh, in the DAPI name system. So I'm going uh, just to register um, this New York Times in DAPI. So I'm going to call it NY Times um, 2 because I think the one is, is already taken. So it's an IP application, and it's not a DAP. And I have to reference um, the servers that must be um, hit when people uh, browse this website on DAPI. So it retrieved the IP address as well as the SSL certificate because DAPI only does um, encrypted uh, communications. And then it will uh, be called NY times two on the DAPI name system. So I'm going to hit add local name. And then I should be able to instantly browse this website on the DAPI name system. So as you see, it appears, um, images are not appearing because they are stored on another server. So this is a security feature on DAPI, but it's not worth explain it, explaining it now. And, um, and yes, I think that's all uh, I wanted to show. Uh, thanks, thanks very much. That's very nice. That's really cool. That's super, super awesome. Wow, you've done a lot of great work, yeah. Um, could uh, are you comfortable also giving a demo uh, that you gave this morning to the physicians? Um, yep. Um, I'll have to start my local air node. Okay. Why don't, why don't, why, while you do that, we'll have Daryl give the week in review, and then you can give that demo. Okay. Awesome. Daryl, are you ready? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. Um, and uh, I just posted the link to Raphael's Medium article in the chat. If anybody wants to check that out, it's there. Uh, okay, so um, here's the week in review for Thursday the 10th to today the 16th. Um, on Thursday in the Governance Committee call, the Governance Committee discussed various scenarios in entertaining a Rev and Dazzle token sale. We considered a pay to play type of application as proof of utility for the Dazzle token. And finally, we discussed how to manage privacy on a public blockchain. Uh, at 11 on Thursday in the DAP developer working group, issues were resolved involving running a standalone ARC network for development and testing. On Friday at the climate coordination call, we discussed ways in which the climate crisis impacts human health. New Zealand's declaration of a climate emergency, 
Steve Ross Talbot demonstrated an eco passport and we talked about Steve Wozniak's e-force and the birth of the decarbonization economic boom. Um, on Monday, uh, on the Casper stand-up call, this week's Casper stand-up covered the Yoneta Lemma. I uh, hope I pronounced that right. It's typically called Yoneta, but yeah. Yoneta Lemma, okay. <laughs> um, at 10 on Monday in the RDEV member group co-op planning, um, they discussed legal issues and expense. Um, on Tuesday, in the Archain Education call, they investigated issues with template fields not being initialized in Liquid Democracy interface and debugging JavaScript in the browser. Also on Tuesday, in the Communications Working Group, we discussed Raphael's improvements to the Archain.coop website and further discussed how to better promote Archain to a layperson investor. We then spent some time working on a title for Steve Henley's last finalized state article. Um, at 11 on Tuesday, at the DAP Developer Working Group, they reviewed email rolling contracts. And today in the Active Members Hangout, they discussed work study participation, available bounties, uh, current work being done from the Ideathon with the idea wallet, liquid democracy, and third-party verification. Uh, they also discussed Steve, Steve Ross Talbot's recent explainer video for the COVID passport project. Uh, and that brings us to now. Thank okay, you, so, questions. Oh, you're, are you ready, Raphael? Go ahead. Um, yes. Um, so I'm going to, since, um, since Derry just mentioned uh, COVID passport. Uh, so I'm going to present uh, what we've been working on with Theo. So you can see it as a more uh, generic um, application than just COVID passport, basically. So it uses only our chain blockchain as an, uh, a platform on which we store and transmit files. Uh, so I'm going to get back to the the login page. So this is uh, the application um, displayed as a mobile application. So um, you log in by input imputing your um, uh, registry URI, your address, and also a private key. So you'll be able to upload documents. And the idea is that um, um, this application makes it possible for two uh, parties to interact with one with another and end up with a document that uh, is signed by both parties and that can be presented to various um, authorities like airport or border patrol or uh, stuff like that. Uh, so I'm going to upload a new document. Um, I'm going to call it um, ID or anything. Um, so it should work with PDF as well as images. I'm going to use uh, for the uh, for simplicity. I'm going to use just a small images, just a small image. So I'm going to hit upload, and um, and the goal is uh, that those operations uh, should be a, a, a ping pong between two parties. I'm going to demonstrate uh, just with one identity. But usually, uh, since you want signatures uh, from both parties on the fight, um, two people have to perform uh, the operations that I will show just with uh, one identity. So let me check, check the Arnett logs. OK, so we see that the file should have been created. OK, so we see this ID file. Um, so when we consult this file, we see that there is one signature on the file. It means that um, um, whoever uh, this um, public key matches to in the real world, um, we, are, we, are, uh, we have the cryptographic proof that uh, this identity agrees or kind of um, uh, asserts uh, this document. And then, uh, so, so this uh, could be a doctor or any kind of um, certificate issuer authority. 
and then uh, so when you you the doctor has a uploaded a file on your um, space, on your uh, reserved space. And then since you want to, um, since you agree on what's been signed, you're going to sign again. And this will add a new layer of signature upon the first one. So this is the pong of ping pong. And then we are going, we're going to get to the, the second ping so the exchange uh, is ping pong ping. <laughs> Let's check the logs. Okay, so a second, a second file should have been created. We will see that it, it includes two signatures. Okay. Okay, so the initial authority signed the document and I also signed it as well. And then um, the point is that uh, it should get back to the initial authority for final signature. So, I, so I, I, I'm hitting this button as Alice, but it should be um, doctor, then Alice, and then doctor again. And then we just have to reload um, to see the final document that includes three levels of signature and uh, can be considered as um, entirely cryptographically agreed by both parties. Okay, so, so this document uh, is on the blockchain. So now there, there are three instead of just one at the beginning. And each one of them um, has um, an additional layer of uh, signature. And the final one is this one. Uh, it contains three signatures. And this is a document that um, you want to present um, if you want to assert that a specific authority um, uh, has agreed to something about you. So this could be a, a, a COVID PDF document saying that uh, you received the vaccine. It could also uh, be something about allergies. It could be also something um, maybe not related to the medical world. And, um, but that's, that's it for the technical demo. Maybe, um, Greg, you want to, to, to talk about it uh, a little bit further. Yes, thank you very much. That was great. I really appreciate you giving that. Um, so so let's just go through the flow in the context of the COVID wallet. So the idea is that <clears throat> the healthcare provider and Alice are meeting face to face because Alice is about to receive uh, a vaccine. So the healthcare provider administers the vaccine um, and uh, concomitant with that, Alice and the healthcare provider um, uh, provide uh, enough public key information that they can, uh, that the healthcare provider can transmit the, um, the uh, document um, representing the fact that Alice has received um, the COVID vaccine uh, to Alice. Uh, so, so the health the healthcare provider is transmitting a PDF that um, that they will sign to to Alice. So first, the document is uploaded to the chain. The healthcare provider signs it. Then it is provided to Alice, who reviews it, um, checking that you know all the information is co correct. Um, and then she signs it. And then that doubly signed. Uh, document is then um, presented one more time to the healthcare provider for signature. And that triple signature is important, right? The first signature um, means that, that the, the vaccination um, certificate can't be faked by Alice. The second signature um, really is, is important um, um, to be underneath the third signature. Uh, if, if Alice just had um, a, a, a vaccine certificate only signed by the provider, then Boris could steal Alice's document and pretend um, that it's Alice, it's Boris's certificate, right? Or, or uh, um, if it's associated with the uh, uh, information, you know, Boris, instead of um, Boris, it might be um, Natasha who, who steals the document and pretends to be Alice. Um, and that's not, that's not secure. 
Um, so the, the next thing is that the healthcare provider signs on top of Alice's signature. And so with that three level structure, um, the attacker, Boris, can't steal it. Alice can't fake it. Um, and so the, the um, border authority or the airline official uh, um, must be satisfied that in fact, this document represents all the information necessary um, uh, uh, to, to allow Alice to uh, board the plane or cross the border. Does that make sense? Does everyone understand the flow here? Um, I have a question about it. Yeah, please go ahead. This could obviously be used for other vaccines and other pandemics and things in the future, right? Oh, there are many other things this can be used for. So let's right. let's let's go through some of uh, just within this scenario. Um, mm -hmm. Let's let's consider uh, what can happen. So because we're in a pandemic, these vaccines are being rushed out without any longitudinal studies. So researchers are really want to, want to see what happens to people long-term. Um, um, and so this is, uh, so because the information is under Alice's control and only Alice has what's necessary to, uh, to provide the unencrypted data, Alice can proffer to a research body an anonymized form of her data. So we can imagine that there's a smart contract that Alice um, is willing to uh, give some uh, of her data that she stored um, into. And at that point, the smart contract um, decrypts the data, anonymizes it, and then um, throws the an anonymized data into a hopper that's available for researchers to uh, slice and dice to get uh, additional information over time about the so effect. people would basically be able to like voluntarily self-report their own like long-term results. Yes, but even further, because uh -huh. it's on the blockchain, they can mm -hmm. be rewarded for it. They don't just have to give it away for free. Right. That smart contract, which is taking Alice's data, can also provide to Alice some tokens, some compensation for her to provide her data. Mm -hmm. Right, so, so Alice is now incentivized, not just because she's you know, doing a good thing um, for the community, but also because she'll get uh, a little bit of a, a reward. But like also, I mean, I see like, I see that that would work very well, but I'm just curious, like, doesn't it also require some type of like cooperation or, or like, um, I guess like um, you could say a shift in the way that a lot of big pharmaceutical companies like view the contributions of people, because I feel like right now they wouldn't necessarily be wanting to pay people to give them those results like usually when a vaccine or another medicine is developed like even the people like the governments and the people who help develop it like don't always you know they still have to pay uh, like in America at least like exorbitant amounts for it you know what I mean uh, so yeah. I'm just I curious mean, pe like, people people pay for the vaccine um, but but with respect to data typically it's given away for free and now what we're doing is we're allowing- Right, so I'm saying that they would have to see that as something of value. That's correct, that's exactly- yeah, I mean, it's, it's not uncommon in some clinical trials for the pharmaceutical company to recruit or whoever is doing the research project, for them to recruit that they pay yes. um, the patients either to say, okay, we'll get you free tests on all these things during the duration of your participation and also we'll pay you for your trouble. Sure, but they don't usually pay people after the fact later on. That's what I'm saying. That is correct. Yeah. That yeah. Is correct. So that would have to be, you know, something that... Anyway, I think it's a great idea, and I can see that it could be really useful in a lot of different scenarios. But I just... That was just something I thought of, that, you know, they would have to be willing to pay people to give them this data, and I just don't know if anything like that has, like really been done before on this, you know, large scale, unless you're basically saying, like, I mean, people can get paid to do surveys and things like that, but that's 
So well, this is this is exactly the point that we've been making for a very long time. Is that yeah that the devil's bargain people have made with companies like Google and Facebook and Instagram and and all of these other large scale data uh, mm -hmm. warehousing solutions is that they they've said okay I don't want to have to deal with all these servers and um, and storage mechanism and all the people that have to babysit those devices and keep the systems running. That seems to me to be too, too much of a headache um, mm -hmm. to put my data online. So I'll give my data away for free um, as long as you give me the, the ability to put my data online for free. But what we've seen is that companies like Google and Facebook and Instagram, they're making way, way, way too much profit on the give away the data for free thing, right? The, 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 um, right. Right. The balance point is way too far off. So, well, I, th I think also what's even more shocking is not just how profitable they are, but the level of control with which they have over our lives is I think even more. Again, oh. my, 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 argu my argument is that if you, if you look at the way be be people are behaving, they don't pay a lot of attention to that. Right, like they wouldn't when, necessarily know when 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 Snowden re re released the uh, information that he did about Project Prism, if people's first response was to joke about it on Facebook, uh, if they really understood what Snowden was saying, they'd get off Facebook. But that's not right. what happened, right? So so um, so so the argument is that I think people will begin to get better personal privacy and security if they're economically motivated to do so. Yeah, I agree with that. Right, so that's that's what we're saying is- But does you, that mean that every user needs to engage in some kind of a deal like this where they're providing data at some sort of a cost? Uh, no, again, the, the, the point is that it can all be, it can all be mediated by smart contracts. So users can come together in co-ops or groups or, you know. Right, uh, but I'm saying everybody that uses that uses the platform need to be in that kind of an arrangement in some shape or form, or is it enough that only some of them do it? Um, again, the platform and the solution does not require, right? They, they could give this away or, you know, it can't, I mean, it's gonna cost rev to use the solution no matter what, but that rev right. could be sponsored by the government or, or as a part of your healthcare premium or any, any number of, of ways that that can happen. So it's not a requirement that people um, uh, make get compensated for giving up their data, but we believe yeah. people should have the right to do that, right? We're, yeah. we're, right? We're, we're like like when you go through a Facebook style solution, you don't have the right. You sign away that right when you sign the agreement to sign up for Facebook. With the, yeah, with the, people don't with really the blockchain, have the right with the blockchain, you, you have the ability, uh, and and therefore you don't have to give up that capability uh, unless you want to. Yeah, yeah, I agree. So that's that's the uh, but 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 uh, so 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 again, just participating in downstream research is is only one niche. You could also put other kinds of information. You could put proof of insurance in this wallet. Mm -hmm. You could put a driver's license in this wallet. You could put um, an educational certificate in this wallet. Yeah. So many, many times I've talked about how um, when refugees leave their um, uh, leave their their point of origin and and land somewhere else, we don't necessarily um, have any way to prove that they are a doctor or a lawyer or whatever, because they have left in a hurry or they've left under um, difficult circumstances. If their accreditations, their certificates and uh, other kinds of recognition are placed in a, um, a wallet like this, then it's, uh, it, it, you know, it's, it's incontrovertible. They are the only ones with the key, with the access. Um, and so, um, you know, <laughs> They're the ones that have those those accreditations, um, and again, using this kind of triple signing mechanism, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a bar association 
can present, you know, in a digitally signed fashion, um, you know, uh, Nora's um, passing of the bar, Nora reviews it, signs it, and then the bar signs it on top of that. And now you have, just like with the COVID uh, document, you have a document that you could present to authorities that proves that you passed the California bar, as an example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good example, yeah. Um, so, um, of course, there are many, many other things that you can do out beyond that, but this kind of gives a, you know, a feel for um, the sort of thing that we're, we're, um, uh, we believe our chain is uniquely qualified for. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in particular, um, you know, uh, storage solutions like IPFS, are, they don't have a search mechanism. So our chain has a query language built in, and that query language is directly connected to the transactional nature, right? So the data for token exchange is transactional in our chain. And that transactional semantics is more or less like falling off a log in Rolang. So those are those are those two features, the transactional bit and the search bit, which are well integrated in our chain. They don't exist in IPFS. You would have to you would have to really re-engineer IPFS to have those kinds of capabilities. So, uh, but but it's exactly those features that enable both um, the ability for people to take back their you know their rights to their data and their ability to sell it, and at the same time, it also is what enables researchers to go and query um, the data. Um, the anonymized data that's on the blockchain. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes me Yeah, think and I think that that would be an important distinction to draw um, about that, about the queer language. I think that's something people would be interested to know, but sorry, Daryl, go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just thinking about, you know, how to, um, you know, at, at some point in time then perhaps uh, those who are using IPFS for their various purposes um, would want to port over to something like our chain. Yeah, I, I think the, the more we start to illustrate these, these use case patterns, I think the more people will start to say, oh, I really want to be building on our chain. I mean, a, a, another way to think about it is, you know, Again, people have made this devil's bargain with with these online data providers, um, uh, and and it is perfectly reasonable to say, you know, maintaining a bunch of servers in my basement and babysitting them and doing all the care and feeding and keeping them up to date and you know re-architecting it every two and a half years, uh, which is what Google and Facebook are doing. That's a lot of hassle and headache. Right. I, I just want to be able to post pictures of Thanksgiving dinner. Thank you very much. Um, uh, but with the with the um, uh, with the blockchain solution, with and in particular with our chain, people continue to get that headache free experience. So Alice can just put something up on the blockchain and she doesn't know where it's stored and she doesn't care where it's stored. Right. And because she knows that it's not behind a firewall that is, belongs to Google or Facebook or the US government. It is decentralized and distributed. That data doesn't sit any specific place. And if someone takes, if for example, uh, some jurisdiction says, all right, our chain is illegal here, then you know, all, for each one of those servers that are being taken down in that jurisdiction, two more spring up in five other jurisdictions. So, so the decentralization, again, means that, that um, she has this, again, headache-free experience. And at the same time, because it's wedded to a blockchain, she then has the ability to exchange it for compensation. So, so, so she, she gets the best of both worlds, right? She's able to, to not have to have um, all of the, the problems and the pains of maintaining, uh, you know, <laughs> an in-home data storage solution. Uh, and at the same time, she also doesn't have to give up all the value that is associated with her, her, um, her data. 
And I would just like to note that uh, the number one source of revenue for the largest companies in the world is precisely this data. Yeah, exactly. I wanted to ask, I had a question regarding finalized state and the COVID identity passport. So, you know, say, you know, I use the, I have the passport, I, um, I'm registered and I have a vac um, vaccination. It's, it's recorded onto blockchain. And then, you know, two years from now, that block where this information is stored, it, it's, it's now an old block. Now with last finalized state, um, the, imp uh, the block blockchain is trimmed away. Old blocks uh, get removed. Would my block with my information be removed or is it somewhere else, perhaps in our space or somewhere? Uh, so it's a, it's a good question. So so the 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 um, simplest answer is that state is not tied to blocks. State is tied to um, the the sort of the the network of addresses that point to addresses. Um, and so when you go last finalized state, as long as your um, uh, your information is still being utilized by some smart contract. Um, then it's not going to be trimmed away. Okay, so it's that utilization of a smart contract, which keeps my information or anyone's information active in on the Archain platform. Therefore, it, it, it wouldn't be uh, susceptible to being removed. That's correct. Okay, That's, so good. Look, so so yeah. So it's a part of the state. Part of the state. Yeah. Okay. So when we say last finalized state, what we're talking about is what state is it that we are currently remembering? So the state can continue to grow. It, might, it may be that over time, um, the state becomes large because people are hoarders. They're, you know, they don't want to let go of any data. Um, but, but it's not because that you have to keep the history of all the transactions on the blockchain. Okay. So that state is, you know, that's in a sense, another way described as data storage. It's data storage. That's what it is. Okay. And, and so uh, as a, as a user, I'm, I'm paying for that storage. Uh, am I paying for that up, up front or as it, as the smart contract goes and retrieves the data? You're, you're, you're effectively paying for it in an amortized fashion over time. Okay. Right. That, that's why Ethereum, for example, Ethereum's model just won't work for these. Like one of the things we, we pointed out with our song is if you, if you tried to store audio data on Ethereum, you end up paying, I don't know, a million bucks to store a three minute song. Right. Because with Ethereum, you're paying for that data storage up, up front, front over the, 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 the life of, of that storage. So, yeah. but we're doing it differently. Okay. Yeah, that's correct. So it's, it's amortized on the back end. Now, there's still tons of work that we want to do to make that data amortization uh, another economic instrument, right? Okay. Uh, so, so, so there's all kinds of there's all kinds of um, strategies around. You know, do, do I if I if I pay a, more upfront, can I get a discount? Those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. okay. And you want to you want to be able to give uh, have a, a give and take on that. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah, this, this, this explanation actually answers a lot of questions that I've had. So thank you. No, thanks for the question. Very good. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, any other questions or comments? Well, we're four minutes before the top of the hour. Um, I think we're, uh, we're good unless there's anything that uh, anyone else uh, feels we need to bring up in this particular meeting. Today is Beethoven's 250th birthday. My goodness. Ba -ba -ba -bum. Happy birthday, <laughs> Beethoven. Nice. Uh, yep. All right, folks. Uh, please, everyone stay safe and uh, see you on Friday, if not before. Great, thank you. Bye, everybody.